From the Lean Enterprise Institute in Boston, this is the WLEI Podcast, where we share stories of people making the world better through lean thinking and practice. For more information about LEI, including how we can help you apply lean thinking, please visit lean.org. In 2021, Toyota Motor Corp became the first manufacturer from outside the United States to sell the most cars in this country. This news hook may very well prove to be transient, based entirely on Toyota's ability to respond to COVID demands and chip shortages and other temporary situational conditions. And yet, this milestone raises key issues about what has accounted for the company's success. What salient takeaways can we, for example, take away for others? What aspects of its production system, which is foundational for lean, have supported its success? How can companies productively balance the need to develop products that dazzle consumers with the need to simultaneously develop the brilliant processes that produce these coveted items? I'm Tom Ehrenfeld. And on today's WLAI podcast, I talk with LAI founder Jim Womack and LAI president Josh Howell about lean's value in today's time of discontinuity. Welcome to the WLAI podcast. Uh, Welcome, Jim Womack. Welcome, Josh Howell. Hi, guys. Hey, Tom. Today, um, we have a great opportunity to discuss some lean themes. The, um, the news that prompts this conversation is the article that Toyota has topped General Motors in U.S. car sales in 2021, the first for a foreign automaker. And this is noteworthy, but possibly, probably temporary. And it really just creates a nice opportunity to explore some um, deeper takeaways. And you both have helped tee up this conversation. And one really intriguing question is whether a lean enterprise can be an industry disruptor in an age of technical discontinuity. And it just makes me curious about what kind of enduring qualities and advantages um, come with the pursuit of lean and the kind of following of it in a disciplined manner consistently over time and um, what might be learned from a comparison of Toyota and say Tesla and the the point is not to beat up on Tesla which has been wildly successful but to Try to try to parse out what's worked for both of them and what challenges lie ahead for each. And once again, what we can can learn from them. So um Jim, are you saying, go ahead. Are you saying are you saying beating up on Tesla has been wildly successful? Or Tesla has been wildly successful? Or both, I guess. Um I was I meant uh that Tesla has been wildly successful and um a lot of Predictions of their failure have been premature, if if untrue. Um, so, uh, you know, Jim, how, how would you kind of let's say let's jump off from the news? Toyota has has had a very successful um, year. Um, so has Tesla. What do you see uh, when you when you look at the, the kind of performance and current state of both companies and, and their uh, immediate challenges? And well, it's interesting that uh, Toyota for 50 years was disrupting an industry, not through products, um, but through a different way to produce, distribute those products, manage the suppliers and so forth. So it's very interesting. It's not what we think of as disruption. Uh, In this age of disruption, people are almost always talking about products, whether that's hardware or software, both. And so Toyota had a a long history of disrupting through uh, creating better processes uh, behind the products. 
Jim, how do you? Just, just curious uh, to that to that statement. How how do you see then like the role that the Prius played, or even let's say Lexus? Well, those were neither um, normal Toyota activities. And the great growth of the Toyota company was not Prius, not Lexus, but uh, doing a sort of um, uh, mass market vehicles uh, in a way that their costs were lower, their quality was higher, their lead times were shorter, and so forth. Uh, I just say that as a background because uh, people look now at Toyota and many see this very slow moving, stolid uh, business. And say, well, gosh, uh, in an age of disruption, that's a very vulnerable thing to be. Good grief. You know, this is the slow moving, uh, you know, plodding uh, creature out there in the middle of this competitive environment. Uh, This is not good. Uh, My point simply was that for 50 years, uh, Toyota was able to disrupt an entire global industry by uh, building a better process uh, without necessarily uh, building a more interesting product. Uh, Let's see, Prius, uh, which was launched in Japan in 97. Uh, was actually envisioned by Toyota at the beginning of the 90s. And by the way, it took them seven years to get a uh, saleable vehicle uh, that they thought it would speak to an environmental market that uh, they you know, thought was going to be a growth market. Uh, and they also thought that uh, smart young people would want to work for a company that was for a change building interesting products. The, the car was, uh, the Prius was born in the dot-com bubble of 1990, when suddenly all kinds of electronics companies were the place to be. And Toyota was shocked that for the first time, young people graduating from university engineers uh, said, gosh, Toyota's boring. Why why would I come over there? So that was uh, uh, a response to a time. It was not their core doctrine, though. And similarly, Lexus was simply a move up into the luxury segment, uh, a very logical thing that uh, historically almost all car companies have done. Uh, they just didn't have the money to do it until 1990. So uh, the, the disruptive power of the company, which we have tried to share uh, with uh, the whole world by trying to explain the methods they used, uh, was inherently uh, about process rather than product. It's also very interesting that uh, Toyota's basic stance on technology was to be a follower rather than a leader and to do it better. They would let someone else go dashing off, for example, and we'll get to this in a minute with electric cars. And then they would uh, take the time to think through uh, the best way to do it. And then they could come up with a product that was comparable, uh, which might be better in terms of quality in terms of, uh, well, cost, uh, in terms of delivering, delivery liability. So uh, that's uh, been their stance for a long time. So then we come to an age where there truly has been a lot of disruption uh, driven by technology and by new entrant companies, put the two together, and they do sort of go together on this scale of disruption. So it's not just the uh, electrification, but it's also the autonomy. And possibly we'll see the vehicle sharing. Uh, Toyota, by the way, has a big stake in Uber, uh, really as an experiment rather than to make money. And then uh, probably the most interesting thing uh, in terms of staying in business is that uh, modern day vehicles both generate enormous amounts of data and receive enormous amounts of data. And what do you do with those data as a competitive proposition? Uh, perhaps it can all be monetized. Perhaps that's the real money in the car business. Um, well, uh, who knows? But uh, that's a lot on the table of question marks of yep. what to do about electrification, what to do about autonomy, what to do about asset sharing, what to do about what I call hyperconnectivity. Mm-hmm. And uh, as a business wanting to stay in business, Toyota wants to stay in business. Uh, like any other business, they would like to not just survive, but prosper. So what is the stance of a lean uh, enterprise uh, in that point in time? So that's kind of background. I was just going to ask a kind of background question, which is this presumption that organizational capability and technological excitement are like 
somehow different paths. I think over the long term, they converge. Mm -hmm. That companies that really mindfully develop uh, organizational capability for learning growth will find that the products they deliver to their customers, the customer's value, Mm -hmm. will manifest that care. Mm -hmm. Um, So I I don't want to kind of halt your thinking, but um, you know, maybe Josh, what, what from your experience have you kind of learned about the value of organizations that mindfully develop their own people and how that kind of plays out in, in what they're able to put into the hands of customers? Yeah, I guess, you know, on, on the topic of capability, I mean, it, it you know, it, it probably helps to be sort of specific uh, which capabilities uh, it is that we're referring to. Yeah. Um, I mean, in in Toyota's case, of course, um, Jim and and others that have followed have helped us recognize sort of the management and the operational uh, capability in that company. Um, with Tesla, we can appreciate the capability that they've uh, engendered around technology, uh, product, um, even some innovations in how they you know handle like the customer. Experience. I mean, even recently, on the um, capability that the Toyota or the Tesla rather is focused on um, maintaining and leveraging, um, we've read about how they've weathered the chip shortage um, issue uh, perhaps more effectively than their counterparts, um, due to the fact that they've kept you know for the longest time they were making their own chips. Um, when they were no longer able to do that to sort of maintain their own supply at an adequate level, uh, they were able to engage with other chip makers, but they had sort of the know-how about chip manufacturing, chip design uh, in-house that they could um, apply to making these sort of non-standard chips work in their vehicles uh, to modify those um, so I certainly think you know capability. Uh, however, one, however, an organization comes about it, uh, either through developing it uh, in some systematic way internally or by purchasing it <laughs> uh, through you know um, through who we who we hire, I guess, or who we um, establish as suppliers and, and partners. Uh, capability certainly is at uh, is 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 at is at issue here. Yeah, and, and Jim, just to, to pull on this thread, it. I mean, lean uh, to me is about organizational learning, kind of formal, um, intentional reflection that builds on experience and um, leads to continuous improvement. Uh, how, you know, can, can you just take us through some meaningful historical incidents with Toyota? Um, uh, basically, in terms of how it's responded to past crises and prepared itself for moments like these. Mm-hmm. Well, let me, let me, yes, let's do that. But let me just back up <laughs> one second. That the nature of the moment is that the entrance, the new entrance of feel, and I think with some uh, justification that they have to go fast. Okay, that speed is the whole thing. Mm -hmm. I'm not talking about speed of uh, getting a brilliant, refined product to market. I'm talking speed about at least getting to launch, where you can do the initial public offering that then funds the rest of the build-out. So therefore, uh, there's no time to do all of the things that Toyota would do. That you hire some young people, you train them up. Toyota always says you can't build good cars before you build good people, before you build good managers. Hey, there's no time. There is no time. You have to go fast. And uh, what we're seeing out of the market absolutely uh, says that uh, this is the way investors look at new entrants with new technologies. They want to see something fast. Okay. So that's totally uh, the opposite of the way Toyota would think about building the business. So I would predict that all of the fast new entrants will now spend quite a lot of time uh, backfilling, retrofitting, reworking uh, the processes that they just cobbled together. Uh, Think of uh, any of these new, and you know, there are a dozen of these new electric car companies out there. 
And they all look pretty much the same in terms of they've got a heroic leader. The heroic leader's got the plan. Uh, the team has signed up to execute on the plan. We're not going to talk about the plan. We're going to execute on the plan. Uh, above all, we're going to go fast. We're going to work all night. Uh, we're going to sleep at the end of the line in our sleeping bags and so forth. Um, so you hire, by the way, it's, it's, it's amazing. Actually, you can do this at all that you hire a bunch of people who've come from all kinds of places, never worked together, no company culture, no processes, okay? And say, okay, you folks, uh, quickly uh, develop and launch a vehicle. So this is the exact opposite of anything that uh, Toyota would ever do. And by the way, they didn't do that way back when. They didn't do that back in the 40s. It took them a long time uh, to get going. So it's just a different uh, situation. And it produces in the short term very different uh, perceptions of uh, how fast people really are. And uh, we'll see. But one quick question, and sorry to, to leap in, but they, the, the one, I think, misconception is that there's consequences, that there's a trade-off in the quality of the product that you put in the hands of customers. And a company like Tesla has thrilled its users. There's just... Mm -hmm deep, enormous mm -hmm. currency. It, people are like thrilled with what they're making mm -hmm. and they don't care how they make it. It doesn't matter to them. It doesn't matter to the customer. So mm -hmm. is there a kind of necessary trade-off behind well, uh, racing, you know, going at, 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 at um, Elon speed to yeah. produce these vehicles that people love? Right. So hang on. Um, that in a new situation with new entrants, new technology, um, there is in the world uh, a group of people who don't even know who they are, and we find out who they are after the fact called early adopters, okay? And these are the folks who are totally focused on the new performance that a product can offer. And we've gone through this with, uh, you know, cell phones. We've gone through this with all kinds of software that you can use on your PC, uh, gone through this now with motor vehicles. Um, the initial early buyers are so, you know, focused on this performance that's not possible from pre-existing products. Uh, you can't get to uh, 50 miles an hour in three seconds uh, in any practical inter internal combustion engine car. Uh, there are just some simple physics involved there. So those people tend not to be very interested in, for example, uh, are there squeaks and rattles? Uh, or does the screen go blank occasionally uh, or to the, you know, the window liners leak or whatever, because that's not why they bought the vehicle. And by the way, it isn't just the performance that they're buying. It's the perception amongst others who might know them that they are part of the future, that they are forward thinking, that uh, they figured out something that other people haven't figured out. And uh, gosh, having a car that doesn't uh, have any squeaks uh, is not part of that, right? So, therefore, that's going to happen. But wait a second, uh, that great uh, middle of the uh, deployment curve, which is all the ordinary boring people, we haven't yet gotten to the truculent resistors. Uh, we're just uh, talking about the boring middle. Uh, whoa, this thing's a daily driver for them, and they want it to start, and they want it to run, and they don't like squeaks, and they don't like leaks, and they don't like screens that go blank. So that's a very different situation. And I think that's an unavoidable uh, situation for uh, these new entrants, that they will have to address the traditional quality metrics uh, at some point. Now, very interesting for Toyota, which has said they will launch in mid-22 uh, their first um, real volume uh, battery electric vehicle. By the way, they did work with Tesla between 2012 and 14 to take a raw four called it the RAV4E, and they simply put under the bottom the battery packs that Tesla was using in the S to produce a few hundred electric Teslas. And they did that to learn uh, both about Tesla, but also about electric vehicles. But uh, that was never going to be a serious uh, product. So now Toyota comes to market in mid-22 with the uh, what basically is sort of a RAV4 electric. It's a, it's a crossover rather than a... Than a um, than a true SUV, but Toyota being Toyota, it needs to be perfect. It's really an interesting challenge. 
<laughs> that uh, they can't produce the kind of dodgy product that uh, all of these, now look, there's nothing to do with Tesla, it's all of these new intricate electric vehicle companies are producing products with all kinds of things that are not really where they need to be. And it's okay because the performance they're offering is just so startling. And right. the image they give the customer is so satisfying. But Toyota doesn't get that slack. It's really interesting. Can they be the first to produce an electric vehicle? The, you know, the batteries can't catch fire, please. Uh, you can't brick it uh, for mysterious reasons out in the middle of nowhere. Um, you can't have rattles and squeaks. That's not allowed either. Uh, so it's interesting. Uh, we'll see whether Toyota can do that. <laughs> it would be interesting to plot out the the sort of the curve of the early adopters to the folks in the middle to the resistors and how that, you know, how, how that sort of defines the customer base over time mm -hmm. relative then to the operational capability that the company, mm -hmm. that a startup is developing. Mm -hmm. And I guess so long as those two things are sort of running at the same rate, <laughs> uh, perhaps it's, it's sort of okay. I mean, you, you, you want the whiz bang thing for the, for the early adopters. That's what they're looking for. Mm -hmm. And Tesla provided that when it got to the middle, uh, and some of these quality issues started to arise, you know, that, that becomes increasingly a problem unless of course, uh, the operational capability, uh, is, okay. is developing, uh, in parallel. And also I'll just say one other thing that, uh, interesting that you get started with electric vehicles, a uh, high price almost seems to be a plus uh, that you've been getting government subsidies that bring down what appears to be a very high price to merely a high price. Right. But uh, that's something that is not bothersome. Uh, you can't uh, say, OK, now we're with the Corolla segment and we're still going to have these quite pricey vehicles uh, because uh, the buyer base uh, can't actually afford that. And because it also is not consistent with what uh, the person just wanting the daily driver wants. They're not willing to pay more for some features that are actually not very important to them. So, we'll, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens. Um, my, my prediction, which I make fearlessly because it's uh, so obvious and it can't be wrong. I love predictions that can't be wrong. <laughs> uh, is that all of the electric new intra players are going to spend the next 10 or 15 years uh, trying to figure out how to get good at stuff Toyota's been good at for 30 or 40 years. Right. And uh, the Toyota has to think about how to balance uh, the need to uh, get with the new uh, technological paradigms uh, with these traditional values associated with their vehicles that they can't afford, I think can't afford to sacrifice. So an interesting contest. It's almost, this is, sorry, Tom, just real quick, but you know, what, one of the things that I, I often catch when it comes to Tesla customers on, on let's say, social media mm -hmm. would be posts of, you know, the latest update on their dashboard for like a Tetris game or something. It has nothing to do with like the vehicle, but it is that sort of fun thing. And those things are coming out all the time. You know, I mean, there's like light shows on the dashboard and, you know, even the, 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 the headlights and taillights, um, you know, dancing to some Christmas tune uh, during the holiday season. Um, and those are, I mean, those are fun things. They're not about the core of what the, you know, the purpose that the vehicle serves. Um, but you do wonder if, if you know, a Toyota, for example, couldn't uh, develop some capability to, to sort of have fun on the periphery like that and do that stuff rapidly and just kind of keep the attention of those, those folks that really are all, all about the, the technological advancements. I mean, sort of the fun, the, 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 the wow factor mm -hmm. uh, of a Tesla that, that, that the early adopters are, are mostly focused on. And it's sort of, it, it, it's inconsequential, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, it's not, it's not, doesn't put people's safety at risk or uh, any of those things. Well, uh, here's the background. Years and years ago in Japan, I had a pretty senior Toyota executive uh, when I was doing an interview. I said, you sure do seem to be grim around here. Uh, and he said, uh, we win because we worry more than other people. And by the way, smiling is Muda. And so I thought, wow, <laughs> this is a tough lot. I'm not sure they're going to be good at uh, dashboard games. Explain but, Muda. Look, you can hire some, uh, you know, weirdo outsiders uh, to uh, put a little uh, tent of fun in your vehicle. I think you could do that. Uh, it may not be part of the core culture, but uh, you can probably do that. Fair enough. Uh, a couple enough. quick things, M Muda. 
being waste, uh, it, you know, excessive. Mm -hmm. um, so this actually raises a question. I, I'm going to throw this one back to Josh. That the, there's there's almost this um, implied convergence. So you have on the one hand a company with great technical expertise that's uh, fueling the very appealing products to a you know possibly early adopter crowd and um, competing with a, a company that's just brilliant at developing robust pros processes and the underlying technology is again the capacity of the company to learn and develop problem solvers at every level and I just want to share that as an open-ended kind of question to you, Josh, what, what's your beliefs on it? The value of that? Um, what, how do you think that relates? Well, I guess, you know, so we, we, we talked a little bit about this, uh, in preparation. Um, you know, our framing here is sort of, um, the, the, the approach typical sort of Toyota like organization, um, versus so to speak that the Tesla like organization. And I think even this conversation, points out um, sort of the, 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 the benefit of each, I mean, the sort of the strengths of each. Um, and so I, I think, you know, where, where my mind goes is more in terms of what can we as lean thinkers or lean organizations sort of uh, learn from both organizations uh, and incorporate into, in, into what we do so that we can be uh, fast and appealing uh, to those early adopters, uh, which has tremendous value. I mean, just look at like stock market evaluations. Um, and, but, and also uh, have that, that sort of um, consistency of purpose uh, in building out our organizational capability, uh, developing problem solvers everywhere throughout the organization. Um, you know, there's an organization that we've um, been interacting with uh, for a number of years that uh, it strikes me is not, not in the automotive industry, but that it strikes me is really trying to, to, to have it kind of both ways. Uh, and that's the organization uh, down in Brazil uh, known as CINT. Um, and what I appreciate about there, I mean, they, they wrote a book called Faster, Faster. <laughs> so the notion of being fast and early and, and you know, um, ahead of the pack, uh, is is definitely something that that they're trying to do as a software uh, kind of service provider, um, but they also, in being fast, uh, they've developed, for example, like a ninety day um, kind of project cycle, where you go through an entire sort of Hoshin Conry phase, and then some kind of A three like planning into execution with much iteration, like fast iteration happening throughout that, that execution phase. And they speak to, you know, the value of that approach, but also uh, the capability that, that was required to be able to, to, to use that approach uh, and how continuing to use it uh, further develops uh, capability throughout the organization. Um, so I wonder if, if, you know, there aren't more organizations like a CINT mm -hmm. who are sort of taking lessons from what they observe companies like Tesla doing, taking lessons from what they observe companies like Toyota doing and saying, well, we, you know, we're not going to, we're not going to approach this as an either or uh, sort of dilemma. Um, it's, it's instead an and thing. Um, I wonder if, you know, I, I guess I, I sort of see that as the, the pathway for us um, lean thinkers as we, as we forge a path forward. Question. It, it, how does concurrent engineering, um, Jim, let me ask you that. How does that translate specifically into what Josh is? is, is uh, well, let, me, let me take a step back, uh, Tom, uh, that I'll get to right where you are there in just a second. That even at the problem solving level, uh, there are some choices that uh, probably many folks uh, listening uh, have had some experience with A3. Uh, probably uh, perhaps fewer people with really rigorous ocean planning. But uh, the key there from a Toyota lean perspective is to spend a lot of time on the left side of the A3 and even up at the top, uh, making sure you really understand uh, the situation. And the problem uh, is in that situation somewhere. And then what is that problem? 
so that if you spend more time up front, as they say, you go slow to go fast. And I've tried that on some of these new entrant companies, tried that personally, Uh, explained to them that you really ought to go slow to go fast. And they say the one thing we don't have is time, that uh, you're used to a clock speed that's just different from the clock reality of the current moment. So that's an interesting question. And I don't, by the way, I don't have an answer, Uh, but it is really interesting that um, you're going to get a better result probably if you take enough time to fully understand the problem. But it may be that by the time you understand the problem, uh, you're just uh, completely lost in the rearview mirror in a competitive situation. So what do you do? And then let's take the uh, specific uh, case of concurrent engineering at Toyota, that uh, concurrent engineering, not to be confused with simultaneous engineering, simultaneous engineering is something totally different in which the people developing the next step in a development process can start work before the previous step is finalized because they understand each other so well and there's so much information shared that you can compress the steps and get to market quickly. That's one thing. Uh, Concurrent engineering says uh, we don't actually know what the technical solution is. And so instead of very quickly saying, ah, Time is of the essence. We've got to make a decision. We're going with this one. Uh, And then development is about proving that was the right decision. Okay. And that has been typical of most of the new entrants uh, in the car space in recent years. They picked a technology. They said, aha, and they've done some work. They've done some thinking. But here it is. We don't have time uh, to wait to, uh, you know, reflect on this. We just got to go. So that a company like Toyota looks very slow footed. And let me just take the case of the uh, battery car that uh, Toyota did the project with Tesla back in 2012, 14. And I think they concluded two things. It was done at the Fremont uh, factory that had formerly been the joint venture Toyota GM factory became the Tesla factory. It's done right there, set up a little sideline to uh, make a small number of these cars, design them. And what they concluded uh, was, A, uh, we're just not like Tesla at all. (laughs) We're just not like Tesla. We can never work with these guys. But by the way, Toyota typically doesn't work uh, on a uh, same level with anybody else that they typically go it alone. That's a a different issue. But they said, boy, these batteries stink. Uh, They're actually heavy. Uh, They're volatile. They've got everything wrong with them. And they're incredibly expensive. So it is premature for Toyota to take a leap into uh, offering battery electric vehicles, particularly for the mass market. This is the kind of Corolla mid market, the RAV4 market, with the technology that is currently developed. So therefore, we're going to take our time. And the taking the time on the batteries has meant they have looked and looked and looked and done a lot of work on solid state batteries trying to figure out how they could get them to work. And there's a big, big, big performance leap there, if you can do it. But at the same time, they said, gee, we're going to keep working on fuel cells because there's some kind of physics calculations that might lead you to think for the long term that's actually a better approach. And we're going to hope we don't have to go too fast. And so it's interesting that the uh, solid state has not worked for Toyota or anyone else yet. It may, it may very well soon. But uh, last uh, December, just a month ago, Toyota made a U-turn from uh, basically driving with the parking uh, brake engaged with regard to developing electric vehicles to a new campaign just sort of out of the blue called 30 by 30, which yeah. is 30 completely new, totally new electric vehicles all across the range of products by 2030. And that's not because they actually think this is the correct long-term solution or the best long-term solution. It's because they acknowledge that uh, the industry is just zooming away with everybody uh, offering these vehicles. And if they offer nothing as an alternative saying, hey, we're just thinking about this, we're doing concurrent engineering, uh, that it's just uh, not gonna work. They've got to do something. So that's how they wound up suddenly announcing 30 all-electric vehicles by 2030. I won't say the heart isn't in it. Uh, I would say that I I think, look, I don't have the inside secrets, but I think they wish this thing would go just a little slower 
so that there was a little more time to think through what the best technical uh, approach is. Final thing, I'll be through, that the psychology of engineers runs against this go slow thing, that uh, engineers really love a design solution. And then development is again about proving that was the right answer. And engineers love that. That's just comfortable and you're making trade-offs and doing all the kinds of things that engineers know how to do rather than just kind of blue sky thinking about all these possible things, which uh, feels very squishy and uh, makes you nervous. So uh, there's uh, some engineering culture out there as well, that the software engineering culture is different uh, from the hardware engineering culture. And uh, Toyota has historically been very much a hardware engineering business. Well, it'll be interesting to see, I mean, as this plays out, it'll be interesting to see what, what Toyota did discover while it was um, spending all that time on the left side of its A3, so to speak. Uh, what did they discover? And how's that going to uh, manifest um, as they start releasing these products uh, in 2022 and, and over the next eight years? Um, mm-hmm. uh, how, how will they uh, catch up to or perhaps race ahead uh, mm-hmm. of their competition? Because they did spend... Um, spend time on the left side um, through experiments with, with Tesla uh, and other organizations. Kim, why don't you guys to actually define, articulate for our listeners what you're referring to when you say spending time on the left side of the A3? Sure, I can take that. Um, so A3, uh, as I think many in the link community would know, um, simply uh, referring to a size of paper, Um, 11 by 17, roughly, uh, inches, uh, as measured here in the U.S. Um, And so the insight that uh, Toyota developed uh, was that um, it's possible, and in fact, uh, arguably more effective, to put sort of all the critical information needed to effectively solve a problem onto a single sheet of paper. Uh, Sort of by, you know, typically that organization gets organized uh, into a sort of left side of the A3, a right side of the A3, the left side laying out what's known about um, sort of the way things currently are, uh, the problem that we're trying to solve, what we understand about the current state, uh, and then the right side uh, sort of detailing what we intend to experiment with, some of the ideas we have, potential countermeasures, uh, if you will, uh, and what our sort of uh, planned actions um uh, will be so we say the left side. Uh, it's that sort of uh, the 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 place where we capture what we're learning uh, through the act of study, uh, studying the way things currently are, and 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 seeking to understand well um, and frame well uh, the problem that we're uh, that we're seeking to solve. Mm-hmm. Okay, because uh, all of these trends just lead me to wonder about the. Um, deep relevance of lean um, right now in our economy with a really fast metabolism where a company like Tesla has been hugely rewarded with a go fast to go fast mentality with a kind of heroic hero mm-hmm. who has um, you know, created a vertically organized company that has thrived within chaos with heroic fixes um, and has frankly delighted customers and profited enormously. Whereas um, Toyota, and it's not like a neat Toyota versus Tesla, it's using these two as we're just casting them as characters who embody differing values and approaches. Um, and the crazy thing is that Toyota was and is and remains disruptive, but I don't think is perceived as that um, mm-hmm. as much. And we're seeing ways that there's like this convergence of approaches, especially with 30 by 30 by Toyota. Um, so help me out by um, parsing through this and articulating what are the kind of like most important lean principles that perhaps are being missed or, uh, um, you know, obscured. Um, if one looks at the evidence of Tesla's exciting success and, and Toyota's enduring um, success as well. Uh, 
uh, and forgive me if that's too open-ended, but I, I'm, I'm trying to pull together the different strands, please. Well, look, let's, let's say that uh, first off, appearances are deceiving, mm. that uh, all of the new entrants in the electric space have said they're going to go fast to go fast. Uh, and that's true up to the point of the first producible vehicle and the public flotation of their stock. And then guess what? They go slow. It's pretty interesting. If you took a start to finish timeline for Tesla, for new products, is it actually any different from Toyota? Uh, if you've uh, looked at uh, the media in the last uh, 48 hours, well, the uh, famous Cybertruck, which was supposed to be a 2021 vehicle, is now suddenly a 2023 vehicle. So it's really slipped two years from the original idea. Uh, everything else that's been done at Tesla, uh, except the derivative products, the Y and the X, did not slip as much as the S and the 3. But uh, the perception is really important, particularly in this hyper, I would say, over, um, you know, over inflated uh, investor market, that you have to be quick to get something out that you can claim as a real vehicle. Then there is the small problem left of how do we actually make this thing uh, at volume with good enough quality, if even not very good quality. So part of this is just a mirage that uh, the fast appear to be faster than they are. And I think uh, in the longer term, the slow will turn out to be faster uh, than they appear right now. So some of this uh, will pass. It is uh, simply a phase. Uh, that's not uh, much reassurance to uh, the uh, diehard lean uh, thinker, uh, thinking of my uh, good friend, uh, Jim Morgan, uh, former uh, uh, chief engineer, buddy and white of the Ford Motor Company, and the most articulate explainer of lean product and process development, who I think really does agonize a bit uh, about these, um, uh, you know, these electric jackrabbits that uh, goes zooming off and uh, make uh, the old fashioned uh, development uh, process is now perceived by Toyota to be irrelevant. Uh, whereas in fact, I think uh, in, the, in the goodness of time, uh, it turns out that you actually can't go fast to go fast and you would be better off going slow to go fast, which by the way, you can do if you have an enormous amount of money in the bank, which by the way, Toyota does, and which by the way, the new entrants to get started didn't. So. Uh, we'll see if this all uh, evens out and levels up. I think the you know perception can be deceiving thing. Um, we should also uh, sort of recognize to the extent that that's true with Toyota. I mean, you know, I guess the experiment you you referred to earlier of of the Toyota ran with Tesla uh, to to expose themselves experientially uh, to a very different way of working. <laughs> um, and, you know, they, they drew whatever uh, conclusions um, from that experience that they did. Uh, but we also hear, you know, from friends like Nigel Thurlow, uh, who Toyota hired uh, some number of years ago, who had deep experience in, in agile methodology coming out of the software world, um, you know, that they, they brought him in uh, to learn from his experience and his know-how. Uh, and experiment um, with with this individual coming from a very different background and culture uh, to see how those um, you know, sort sort of faster um, cycle based <laughs> uh, approaches um, could jive and enhance and and um, influence positively uh, perhaps the more methodical uh, A three based approach that the company had had developed and and uh, gotten such experience with. I mean, you know, I've even um, participate in conversations within the lean community with certain notable figures um, in debate around um, sort of the methodical, the, the traditionally methodical approach uh, of A3 um, versus something that, um, you know, often gets practiced more quickly, uh, like, like kata cycles <laughs> um, and sort of, you know, which is better. Um or even which is Toyota more emphasizing these days? And, you know, there are reports that, um, that Toyota itself uh, spends less time uh, on, on the, the thorough methodical A3 today than they once did, um, migrating towards something more, more quick uh, that you might find in, you know, in, in an agile methodology or, or a kata approach. Mm -hmm. um, now, again, I don't think it's, a, it's an either or um, situation, but uh, a, a sort of a yes and thing. 
Um, but in any case, uh, these are these are interesting uh, debates and discussions and developments uh, that that uh, they're sort of at the center of of this conversation. Well, I'm gonna say that we should wrap up. We want to be. Um, uh, we want to wrap up. <laughs> Let me just ask you guys each to share maybe final thoughts. Take a second. <laughs> well, here's a final thought for the uh, lean crowd that uh, this has been a particularly challenging environment. Uh, two things at once, a fundamental disruption of the whole industry that Toyota is in. As Akio Toyota has said, this is the once in a century disruption. I doubt that he has any data on that, but uh, okay. Uh, so on the product side, uh, there is this once in a century disruption, while uh, there is this, uh, if you will, biological disruption of the whole production apparatus. So that uh, COVID comes in just in the middle of this electric uh, vehicle and autonomous vehicle, and we haven't even talked about that, um, you know, situation. So this is just particularly challenging for a methodical, uh, precise, um, tight uh, organization like Toyota. And again, uh, in the short term, they uh, look a little bit uh, plodding and unresponsive. And uh, my uh, belief will be that in the long term, uh, they will uh, look a lot better than people uh, tend to think they are in the short term. Uh, that, uh, as folks may know, Toyota did brilliantly with the logistics part of COVID uh, for the first, uh, really, 18 months of the crisis. And then just too many suppliers went down. And uh, this is particularly in Penang and in, in Malaysia that had been doing great with COVID. It really just wasn't there. And then suddenly they locked down the whole city and closed all of the chip makers. Um, so therefore, uh, even Toyota now, at the end of the pandemic, is uh, suffering. And uh, people hear that and think, well, gee, uh, A, all this trouble is due to JIT, which of course it's not because hardly anybody practices JIT outside of the Toyota world. So therefore, how could that be the problem uh, when hardly anybody's doing this? Uh, if you actually know something about this, that no, that's not the problem. Uh, but it is that uh, in uh, situations both competitive and you know, what, what do we say, biological, that are sufficiently disrupted, uh, even the best possible system uh, does struggle. That yeah. uh, we would love to believe, all of us as human beings, that we can build bulwarks against chaos and uh, catastrophe. We just want to believe that. And so then you think, well, gee, Toyota's got this wonderfully uh, robust, uh, precise, thoughtful system. Uh, surely they can deal with this. Brazilian. And it turns out, uh, yeah, some uh, better than the average of the other players. But, you know, if they have a, a big enough wave, uh, sinks all ships. Okay, remember that a big enough, uh, when the tide comes in, it raises all boats. Well, a big enough tsunami sinks all the boats. And this has been uh, pretty tsunami like yeah. uh, what's been going on both competitively and out in the physical uh, world. Okay. I guess. <laughs> I guess my final thought would be, uh, you know, uh, th this conversation sort of makes me think of, that perhaps what's being disrupted, at least in so far as our community uh, might be concerned, are certain notions of cer certain dogmatic notions. <laughs> so it's not, you know, uh, whatever, A3 or Akata, it's not Toyota or Tesla um, and uh, lean or agile. Um, it's sort of, look, all these things can be helpful uh, can be effective, uh, and the question is, you know, what can we draw from from all of it uh, in our own practice as individuals, in our own um, processes as organizations, um, to be both disruptive and methodical, uh, to be both quick and thoughtful, uh, pursuing high quality. Uh, I think, you know, I think TPS embodies that and has for the longest time, uh, but certainly out in out in you know those of us uh, emulating. Uh, seeking to learn from Toyota and put it into our own practice, uh, often do and have fall, fallen into certain dogmatic ruts. Um, and I don't know, I guess this makes me think that that, that that's where the disruption uh, might be, I think, to our benefit, uh, ours as a lean community, uh, should we should we choose to 
you know, whatever, open our minds a bit uh, to learn from to learn from both. Generous thanks for Jim Womack and Josh Howell of the Lean Enterprise Institute for joining me on this episode of WLAI. Thanks as well to producer John Cotter and to LAI's Matt Savas for their work on this as well. And above all, thanks to you for listening in. Please share any comments and questions you have with us at pod, P-O-D, at lean.org.